Bioimaging is, as the name says, imaging for biology. And so it refers to all of the set of techniques, technologies and methods that allow acquiring visual observations of living systems at many different temporal and spatial scales. My name is Virginie Ullmann. I am a research group leader at Embly BI and my group works on bioimage analysis. So maybe it's good to remember that um, really the goal of biology is to understand living systems. And to do so, a good way is to actually observe the system we're interested in. So this is what bioimaging is useful for. It provides us with visual readout, visual observations of um, the things we want to investigate. So bioimaging um, can tell us, for instance, how cells get affected in the context of a disease or how tissue and organ forms during embryogenesis. And it is worth noting that um, bioimages, or let's say rather visual observation, really are the primary source historically of biological information. This is how biologists in the past used to do biology. They observed what they were interested in. Nowadays, thanks to the imaging technologies that we have, um, biological experiments routinely acquire large amount of image data. And what is interesting is that because of the wealth of information that they contain, these images may actually be interesting and useful for other researchers than the one who have acquired them. So there is also a lot going on in terms of sharing image data across experiments and across the scientific community. Modern biology is quantitative, and it means that uh, we want to have more than qualitative observations of the system we study. We want to have specific numbers that describe them. And when it comes to images, this is particularly difficult because a lot of the things we may want to measure are either very cumbersome to obtain if we do that manually or simply impossible to assess by the human eye. So a lot of image analysis in biology is automated, done by a computer, but it is really difficult to design algorithms that are able to do things like counting cells or outlining their contour um, in a general way and across all the different types of image data that we have. This is specifically where deep learning can help. It can help us design algorithms that translate well and generalize well across the different uh, types of data that we have, but that also scale computationally very well with the amount of data that we generate. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning that has gained massive popularity over the past decade. Deep learning relies on algorithms called artificial neural network, and it basically attempts to have machine learn how to understand information and extract information from complex data sets. In its most classical form, deep learning works in a paradigm called supervised, so we have the machine uh, learning relationship between known pairs of input and outputs, such that it is then able to predict the output for inputs that it has not seen before. Deep learning is very data hungry, and this means that in order to train a deep learning algorithm, one needs a large amount of curated, well annotated data that is not easy to obtain. Then deep learning, because of its black box effect, can also be unpredictable in that it can work very well on a specific data set and then fail on another one that comparatively looks very similar. So in terms of roadblock, I would say that the first big one is that um, setting up a deep learning pipeline requires a lot of technical expertise and resources. And second, using a deep learning pipeline that is already out there requires some good understanding of how it has been set up in order to understand its limitations and capabilities. Because it was so popular over the past few years, uh, there has been a lot of good research done in deep learning, and it means that there really are a lot of great methods out there. Uh, but making them available in the context of bioimage analysis problems is not entirely straightforward. And so what this means is that, on one hand, method developers need to make sure that their methods are available and well documented, such that they can be reused. But also, biologists need to have guidance available such that they know how to use these methods appropriately and be confident in the results they produce. So what really needs to happen is more discussion between the two communities such that there is knowledge transfer and exchange of ideas. 
Together with colleagues from EPFL, we have put together a list of good practices that we recently published in IEEE Signal Processing magazine. But in a nutshell, the advice is first, use as much as you can available resources from trusted public repositories, such as the Biomodel Zoo. Second, inform yourself as much as you can on the algorithm that you used to make sure you use it responsibly. And third, and most importantly, maybe ask yourself whether you really need deep learning in your application, because that may not always be the case. If you want to have a feel of how rich and how beautiful image data can be in biology, you can have a look at the bioimage archive that we host here at EMBL EBI and that contains some examples of such data sets.